we are going to start the ball rolling by looking at some of the numbers that we're going to be using in this course. Uh, we can't talk about calculus and we can't talk about analysis until we understand the numbers that we're allowed to use. So let's just quickly introduce a couple that you're a couple of sets of numbers that you're probably pretty familiar with. We're first off we've got the natural numbers. These start at one and count upwards. Some people would define the natural numbers to start at zero. Both are valid conventions. We'll just use the convention that they start at one for this course. All right, that's the natural numbers. Uh, the second set that you've probably met before uh, will be the integers. I see the sorry natural numbers. The integers, which we write as a z with a double line in the middle, is just all of the negative and positive whole numbers, if you like. Those are our integers. And then if we want to fill in the gaps between the integers, okay, so we're maybe thinking of the number line that you might have been used to from the past, um, we can talk about the rational numbers. Okay, so these are q. These are the rational numbers. And these are the numbers that can be written. Now we'll just practice some notation for sets as fractions of integers. Okay, so it's a set of all p divided by q's, where our p and q are integers, so we can write it neatly like that, and where q is not equal to zero. All right, now these numbers um, do a pretty good job of filling in the gaps between the integers. We can pretty much get as close to any number that we like by just choosing our fraction to be sufficiently uh, detailed. Now, the rational numbers obey a few rules um, that we're just going to take as given. So first is that we have a multiplication and addition like this, and that they behave nicely across brackets. So they satisfy what we call a distributive rule. Uh, we also have that if we have two of these rational numbers, so given R, S, and Q, exactly one of the following is true. And that is that given two numbers, we can compare their sizes. Either R is going to be less than S, R is going to be equal to S, or R is going to be greater than S. Now this, we do need to say this because, for example, we can represent the same rational number in different ways. So the number 2 can be represented as just the number 2 divided by 1, or 4 divided by 2, or 6 over 3. And any of these rational numbers, in fact, have lots of different ways that we can express them. So this little property here that we have exactly one of these statements being true just gives us uh, what we need, and that is the, th the final thing that must be true. And if we have R less than S and S less than T, this implies that R has to be less than T. So the rational numbers are nicely ordered. So we call, if you like technical language, Q is an ordered field. Okay, so those are our rational numbers, and maybe we can develop calculus uh, just using these numbers, because we seem to be able to get as accurate as we like, um, and sort of go as close as we like to any point on a number line with these rational numbers. So maybe they are a suitable choice for our calculus. But as it happens, there are some problems with the rational numbers. So for example, you've probably met these before, things like square roots and e, and all sorts of other numbers like pi, these cannot actually be represented as rational numbers. So it means that there are numbers that fit on our number line that we can't represent in this way. And we'll have a look at the sort of the classic one, which is root 2. So let's just have a quick look at the irrationality of the square root of 2. A cautionary tale. So let's just see if we can make this into a mathematical statement that we can do something fun with. Um, so usually when we are working on a course like this one here, like analysis, or perhaps in 302, the algebra course that you may have taken, um, we tend to work by making statements called theorems and then proving them. So our theorem here 
is basically we want a nice concise statement that expresses exactly what it is we want to prove and ignores everything else. So our theorem is there is no rational number whose square is 2. Okay, we haven't actually introduced square root as a concept yet, so the way we express it is we say there is no rational number whose square is 2. Okay, so this theorem is just a single statement which is either true or false. Either there is a rational number whose square is 2, in which case our theorem will be false, or there is no rational number whose square is, whose square is 2, in which case our theorem would be true. So a common proof technique is to assume the opposite or the negation of our theorem and then try and find out something contradictory. So here we want to negate our theorem, so we'll do proof by contradiction. So to negate the statement we're just going to say assume there is a rational number whose square is 2. Now as theorems get a bit more complicated, they're not always expressed as one simple statement like this one. Sometimes they can be a little bit messier. And when you're doing a contradiction proof, negating the theorem correctly is something that we're going to have to work on. But this is a nice easy one. So we assume there is a rational number um, whose square is 2. Okay. Now, once we've assumed this, that means we can actually write this number down. So let P over Q be such a number. That's great. Uh, we've got P over Q. Now, it's also good to try and be as restrictive as possible when we come to these things. Now, we talked before about the fact that rational numbers can be represented in lots of different ways. So it'd be good if we could just reduce this down to a single one. Um, and just notice that if I have different rational numbers like 3 over 2, 6 over 4, these are all 1.5, basically different ways of writing 1.5. Um, we can do, I don't know, 9 over 6, etc, etc. We can notice that there's kind of like a simplest one, which happens when you cancel out all the common factors. Um, so we're just going to assume that we've got that version of it. And so and assume, we can assume without losing any generality therefore, that P and Q have no common factors. That will come in useful shortly. Okay, so, what we have is a rational number P over Q, uh, such that if we square it, we get 2. Now, when we're doing a mathematical proof, usually we're going to produce a sequence of statements that are logically equivalent to each other. Um, that means that I'm going to, if, the, if two statements are logically equivalent, it means that I can replace either one of them with the other, and the truth of the statement is exactly the same. And we note this with an if and only if, or a left and right arrow like this one here. Okay, so all I've done here is just replaced p over q squared with p squared over q squared. And I can also then multiply through by q squared to get p squared is equal to 2q squared. Okay, that's cool. So we've done that. Um, what can we see that's interesting here? Can we um, derive or make any interesting statements about what p and q must be? from this statement that we've just produced right here. That's a big nasty fat pen, let's fix it up. Well if you look at it, it says that p squared is twice something, which means that p squared is even, which means in turn that 2q squared is even, uh, but if p squared is even, then p itself must also be even because the square of an even number is an even number and the square of an odd number is an odd number. So this implies p 
p squared is even, or well, p squared and hence p. That means that p has not actually been written in the simplest possible way. We could write p as 2 times something else. Okay, we've, we're going to incorporate our new information, which is that p is even. So, uh, so we'll write, therefore, p as 2 times m. We know that because it's even, it can be written in such a way, and so we should go ahead and do that. Seems like a good idea. What we'll do now is we'll substitute this back in. We get... 2m squared is equal to 2q squared, which gives us 2m squared is equal to q squared. Okay, I'm just make, turning that 2 into a 4 and dividing through by 2, which implies... Q is even, by exactly the same logic that P was even. So now we have found our contradiction. Because we went ahead and we assumed that P and Q have no common factors, that certainly means that P and Q cannot both be even. We have just shown that they must be, therefore such a P divided by Q does not exist. So this contradicts P and Q having no common factors. So we have obtained a contradiction. And the theorem is true. So what we were looking for the whole time is just something that is not right, something that contradicts one of the assumptions we've made. Because we found such a thing, um, our theorem must therefore be true, and there therefore is no rational number whose square is 2. So going back to our argument about the number line before, it means there are very definitive gaps in a number line. Um, there is a hole uh, where the square root of 2 should be, so in conclusion, um, our rational numbers is not, are not going to be a suitable choice as our number system for doing calculus on because of this hole, of these holes. So one of the sort of fundamental things that we are going to end up relying on is the fact that there are no gaps in a number line anywhere. There are no little punctures that have been taken out like square root of 2 or pi. Um, we need to work with the whole continuum. So we're going to, to extend shortly, we're going to ex uh, show how we can extend our number system from these rational numbers uh, to real numbers, which is essentially the set of rational numbers with all of